Ira Sankey is. Raise your hand if you know who Ira Sankey. Ira Sankey. Look at the top of the page there. You'll see his name at the top of the page. I'm not sure whether he wrote the music. If it's the right hand side, does that mean he wrote the music or does that mean he wrote the words? Which is it? Anybody know? But, uh, is uh, familiar with that? So he wrote the words. Ira Sankey. Ira Sankey was the Cliff Barras for D.L. Moody. And uh, boy, he has a great, great f close uh, relationship and friendship uh, with uh, many gospel uh, writers back in the last part of the 19th century when D.L. Moody was traveling across the world preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus and it was just absolutely a um, great time. D.L. Moody started the Moody Bible Institute in uh, probably somewhere around 1882, I think, if I can recall. And Moody started out doing it by faith. And he did something that is, was amazing. He never charged tuition. Everybody went free. You say, well, where did they get the money? He asked for people to send 10 cents a month. 10 cents a month. And uh, as he started the school, there was a, another fellow in England who had heard about him because he'd been over to England. And uh, he was getting ready to go to the mission field. And his uh, dad was one of the wealthiest men in, uh, in England. And he was, someone told him, uh, they said, you are going to the mission field, you don't have to worry about uh, money and, uh, because your dad and your family can pay your way. Well, C.T. Studd is who it was, Charles T. Studd. S-T-U-D-D. -D. You ought to read his biography. It's an uh, ab absolutely outstanding uh, human being. And so what he did, he gave away all of his wealth. He said, I wouldn't be going by faith if I didn't give away all that I had. So he got down to what we would consider about $1,500 of his estate. And he said, I'm going to send that to D.L. Moody to start the Moody Bible Institute. And the first $1,500 that D.L. Moody received was from C.T. Studd, a missionary going by faith. He said something that I've always remembered. They wrote, and they wrote about him, and he said, he said this. I love to find myself in a difficult situation and then I can enjoy the luxury of the Lord getting me out. <laughs> you write that down and think about it. I love to find myself in a difficult situation and then I can enjoy the luxury of the Lord getting me out. Completely sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he spent 15 years in China and uh, came back, and his wife was his deputation secretary. She stayed home and, and wrote write letters and, and encouraged people to send help for, the, for him while he was in China. He came home for several years and then went back to Africa and stayed the rest of his life in Africa. I think in, during their marriage they would saw each other about three years during their whole marriage. And uh, it's not because she couldn't go, it's because of the danger of the places where C.T. Studd went. I've always admired people like that, I knew. And I think sometimes, I wish I could have that kind of faith, but you know I can. Uh, the same kind of savior that, that guided C.T. Studd is the same savior that's alive today, and he's got us, but we were in fret and everything else. No. So tonight we get over to verse 4 and 5. 
of chapter 22. The Bible says, and they shall, and there shall, well, let me go back to verse 4. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And verse 5. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle. Neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Boy. Well, for, we talked about the Lord. We got to this point where we talked about what we will do in heaven, and we got talked about we will enjoy exhilarating worship like we've never experienced before. And I told about the late Dr. Late R.G. Letourneau. He didn't like to be called doctor, and he was just R.G. Letourneau, and he always would introduce himself. He said, I'm just an old greasy hand mechanic that the Lord has blessed. And... Uh, give his testimony. And uh, <laughs> I remember he was out in San Francisco, California at the Billy Graham Crusade. He got to give his testimony out there. And George Beverly Shea sang, How Great Thou Art. And you know when Bev Shea enters, it, it ends his song, he how great thou art, it goes up high and then it breaks it down like that. When he does, well, everybody's quiet. Well, R.G. was standing there, there were about 25,000 people there, and R.G. let out a big amen. <laughs> and uh, they tell me, I'm not sure, but they tell me that on the way home, he got it put to him by his wife, saying, there is a time to say amen, R.G. <laughs> he said, well, man, it, when you think about what, uh, what, how great our God is, Everybody ought to say amen, right? Amen. Sure, you sure should. He said this, when I get to heaven, I'll join with all the saints in a heavenly choir and uh, with the Lord Jesus as the conductor. I'll be the, in the bass section of the choir and we'll be singing the Lord Jesus will stop and he'll say, R.G., will you lower your voice a bit? You're singing a little bit too loud. Can I tell you another interesting story about him? He only went to the sixth grade. And, and, and listen, I would be standing here if God did not use this man in my life. His wife and family are reason I'm standing here today. He had a, has a, he, he designed earth moving equipment. Now his earth moving equipment blade was as wide as this pew right here. When they would, when they'd go pick up dirt, the, the blade would be as wide as this pew. He had three of those. And each one of the wheels was operated by electric power from a giant generator that was fired by a Cummins diesel engine. And you have to see it to believe it. Go online and you'll, you'll see, just put L127 and you'll see Mr. Letourneau's huge, huge uh, earth moving equipment. In fact, when they built Interstate 20 through Texas there, uh, he, cleared it, he cleared it off just testing his equipment. He told it he would give a bonus to any one of his other workers that could tear it up. <laughs> and so he went out one day and he always would drive his little Volkswagen along beside the blade and watch it as it would dig. He'd be driving along, or he'd drive up close on his left side. And uh, one day he drove up behind it. Now, this is like driving up behind a machine whose motor would be over across to Brother uh, to Brother uh, uh, Dennis's house. 
and the, the our operator would be about 35 feet up in the air. And he could look back, and it, the whole thing operated just like this, forward, backward. If he pushed forward like that, that thing would go forward, and he pushed buttons to, it was all electric. Well, Mr. R.G. parked his Volkswagen behind that machine. Well, he went out to somewhere to watch something. I don't know what, they don't know what he would, but the driver got up there and backed this big L-127 over that Volkswagen. Well, when he saw it, he thought Mr. Letourneau was in it, and he jumped down, running over there, just screaming, and walked up to it. Well, when he got up there, there's the Volkswagen just flat as could be because one of the big tires about this wide, and you had to reach up like that to get to the top of the tire. And he uh, uh, looked to see if Mr. Letourneau was in there. And Mr. Letourneau walked by up there and he said, yep, he said, look at it. It'll fix a Volkswagen, it'll flatten a Volkswagen, won't it? <laughs> and he turned and walked off, and they came, picked it up, and put it over in the steel mill. He was that kind of fellow, never worried about one thing. Never worried about one thing. And you know, uh, he gave away so much money till sometimes it would get to the point where he would have nothing. Now, I'll tell you this, I was the office boy for the plant when I was a student there. That meant that I supplied with paper, pencils, pens, and things, and all of the secretaries that would just leave me a note, and I'd go pick it up for them. His credit was so bad that I couldn't, they would not even let me buy a pencil on the credit downtown. 1,700 employees with no money. And you know, it, it was, so many people told him just to, just to file bankruptcy. He never did it. He trusts the Lord. And he told me six months later, he said, right now I have $40 million worth of orders on the drawing board right now. He designed the first offshore drilling rig. And they didn't know it would float. And they all went over there to Vicksburg, Mississippi, right out to the, the Mississippi River. And he was standing there and they said, push her off into the, into the river. She's going to float. And she floated. Went out into the ocean and it, they put the, they, what they do, they put uh, the uh, bars down on the bottom of the ocean and it picks the uh, offshore drilling uh, platform up off of the ocean. Well, the first one, they couldn't get it loose. From the, from the bottom of the ocean, and it was sinking the platform. They asked Mr. Letourneau what to do about it. He said, they're built of pipes. They're built of pipes. He said, what you do is you shoot water, high pressure water down there, and blow the dirt away, and it'll work. They did that, and it worked. He said, you boys need any more help? Let me know. <laughs> I don't know how he did that, but he did it and just was a, such a blessing, such a blessing. I used to take the mail to him, and he would probably get 20 to 25 letters a day asking for money from all sorts of organizations across the country. And did you know what? He stopped and read every one of them. Didn't miss a one. Oh, may God raise up some more people like that who will walk with the Lord and love the Lord and know that, hey, there's, uh, God blesses a, a layman as well as priest. He's a, he's a founding, uh, he's a founder of the Christian Businessmen's Committee that had businessmen all over the United States. It was just really, really very, I, and I have such respect for him, and he founded the college. Today the college is going, they, they run about 4,000 students, and uh, they only accept about 60% of those that apply and it's a highly, highly tech school. And they train pilots, they train uh, air traffic controlmen, they train, they, tra they, have, um, they have a multi-million dollar training 
program for pilots and, and, uh, and for people who uh, uh, are at, in air traffic control. They also have trained mechanics on, uh, and you might get on a plane at some time when you get on a plane, probably the one of the pilots that it is Delta would be a graduate of the school that I graduated from. Man of real faith and walking with God. Now he's in heaven with the Lord. And uh, I, sh I sure miss him. I wish I, I, wish I could have uh, had him come to my church and treat, uh, speak it up my church after I graduated, but that never was possible. But I learned to love and respect him. And I just added this tonight. Don't charge anything for extra stuff like this, but I hope that it'll, it'll be a blessing to you because he's just an old-fashioned, Bible-believing believer that believed that God could do anything if he had let him do it in his life. He surrendered to the Lord. One other thing that happened that changed the entire earth-moving equipment business. And everyone of you listen to this about faithfulness. He got up every morning and he was in his office at 7 o'clock. He didn't have an office, he had a drawing board. He would go home for lunch, eat lunch, and take a 30 minute nap. Be back at the plant, go home at 5 o'clock, have a short meal, go back and work till 10 o'clock. That was every day, five days a week. And he traveled on the weekend and spoke in churches. He had, uh, he had told that he had talked with some buyers and they wanted to buy some earth moving equipment. And he had to design a certain type of earth moving equipment that had to do with the electric wheel. He had an electric wheel that would take an auto, a truck down the road at 55 miles an hour. And so he went home on Wednesday afternoon at 5 o'clock and he ate his supper and he told his wife, he said, I have to have this done by tomorrow or this thing is going to, we're going to lose lots, millions of dollars. And he said to his wife, you take the young, take his children and you go on to, go on to a prayer meeting and I'll go on over to the plant and see if I can come up with something. He drove up in front of the plant and parked and the Holy Spirit said, RJ, you're not giving me number, I'm not one, number one in your life. Your job is number one in your life. And the Holy Spirit convicted him so much till he said, all right, if my company goes broke, it doesn't make any difference, I'm going to church. And he went over into the church, walked in, sat down by his wife, Bible and study, prayer meeting, prayed, and had, had prayer meeting, and he went, walked out and got back into his little Volkswagen, driving back to the plant to see if he'd come up with something, and immediately something hit in his mind that changed the entire earth moving equipment business in just a second. And he always says this, I believe with all of my heart I'd be a broke man today if I had not decided that Jesus was number one in my life. And any time he signed his name, he always put Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I look forward to seeing Mr. R.G. in heaven. Mr. R.G. won't be walking with a limp because he was in a terrible automobile accident right outside of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and almost died, left him crippled. He was going somewhere with a quartet to preach and they were going to sing. Two, in the, two of the quartet was killed in the automobile accident. Lots of trials. His oldest son got in plane, crashed plane, died. Just a young man, 21 years old. He had his days. But you know, for some reason or other, that man just kept right on trusting the Lord. And he started this Bible college, and I had the privilege of going there. And I'll never get over it. We'll be enjoying exhilarating worship like we've never experienced before. 
How many of you like Handel's Hallelujah Chorus? You like it? Oh, I could listen to that all day long. And I can't even stay seated when it starts playing. One of the most magnificent pieces of music that's ever been composed. This music is one of the favorite classic songs in history. It, it is absolutely beautiful and one can only imagine what it's going to be like when the instruments break loose in glory when we see the Lord Jesus Christ. Back in 2014, Arrowhead Stadium broke the Guinness World Record for the loudest stadium, going off with an amazing 142.2 uh, decibels during a 41-14 Chiefs win over the New England Patriots. That's considered the loudest roar on history. The roar of a jet engine is 100 feet away produces 140 decibels. Arrowhead has always been loud, but has been much louder since they became uh, contenders in the National Football League. However, a crowding, a crowded, <coughs> screaming bunch of football fanatics is no match to the loud praises that you and I will be involved in when we get to heaven. Secondly, if you're taking notes, we will employ invigorating work that we all will actually embrace. And as Christians who love the Lord will love serving him, and the Bible says that if we are faithful in serving him here, our responsibilities in heaven will be even greater because in reading what the Lord Jesus Christ said in the parable in Luke chapter 19, verse 17, he said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. What is the rest of it? I will make thee ruler over ten cities. Did, uh, did, he, did he say ten cities? No. Yes, he did. Ten cities in exchange for our faithfulness in small matters. Years ago in Texas when I pastored there, there's a man and his wife and two children visited our church. And they kept visiting our church, but they never would join. And finally I told him that I, I, I went to see him and I said, what, what is it, Pat, that you're, you're, the reason you don't want to join our church? Uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, Pat was a sheetrock hanger. He could, he could hang a piece of sheetrock by himself. <laughs> You've anybody ever heard anybody doing something like that? He could do that. And uh, he said, I come to your church, and it, it was high auditorium, you know, way, well, I don't know, six, 60 feet high, uh, maybe 50. And right up in the corner, there is a piece of sheetrock that was not straight. And he would sit in the service, and it would almost drive him nuts, he said, knowing that that sheetrock was not straight. I, he said, if you will let me straighten that sheetrock, I'll join the church. <laughs> I said, okay, Pat, that's good. Well, that Sunday, Pat and his wife came forward with their two children, and uh, they, he, they presented themselves for membership in the church, and the young people, of course, the kids were saved later. And uh, Monday morning we went to school and I parked in the parking lot out by the church. And there was Pat was, uh, gathering all of his scaffold and getting ready. And he put, went, put it all the way to the top. And Pat went up there and, and fixed that, uh, and fixed that, tore that sheetrock out and then put it in real nice and straightened it up. I tell that to tell this, that later on I was talking about what we'll be doing in heaven. And he said, if you're faithful over a few things, I'll make thee ruler over many things. And, and he said, you mean to say God's going to make me hang sheetrock uh, in, for eternity? He said, I don't do that. I don't want to do that. I said, wait, 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 wait a minute, Pat. You, the, the Lord said, if you'll be faithful over a few things, I'll make you ruler over many things. You might be in charge 
of all the sheetrock hangers. <laughs> and he seemed to be real pleased with that. Well, <laughs> 10 cities. That means that since our lives in the new heaven and new earth are simply extensions of our life here on earth, we shouldn't be surprised that the Lord plans on keeping us working there. It certainly will be a place of, it certainly won't be, rather, a place of eternal retirement when you do nothing but play shuffleboard and float on a cloud playing a harp while living off of our eternal 401k. No, no, uh, that'll never work out. That won't work out. Just think for a moment about what this involves. If a new heaven and new earth brings us back into the pre-fall conditions, we can see that what we will be doing throughout eternity, and I say throughout eternity, but that's, that's a bad statement. You can't say throughout eternity, right? Because you can't get throughout eternity. That's hard for us to grasp as, uh, as believers, but it, 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 if we're going to be back like it was when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, then basically it will involve two things. Even though there may be many, many other things that we will be doing, we can basic biblical on two things. So note that first of all, we will be cultivating and creating. Back in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam to dress the garden and keep it. Now, why would he do that? Since God created him and placed him in the garden in a perfect situation. You think about this. Why would he have to dress something and keep something if it would work perfectly? You ever think about that? Well, think about it, okay. Uh, and, uh, he said to dress it and keep it. The Garden of Eden was the, was the environment that God created for a relationship with, uh, that could take place. And Adam and Eve were responsible to dress and to keep it. Not just pluck fruit off of the tree and eat it. No, but to take care of the garden. Now the word dress in the Greek means to practice agriculture to till the ground. Wow. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 7 uh, says that. And the, and the Hebrew word means to work it out. To work it out. And the word keep means to guard or preserve or, or to be faithful to and maintain. That may sound strange, but Adam and Eve were to take care of uh, if it uh, so well that it wouldn't become better than it was when God gave it to them. Right? That's, that's a simple logic that we can come up with. He commissioned them, both Adam and Eve, to take care of it, to cultivate and preserve what he had given them. And more than that, Adam was also to be a creator as well, which he used his... Uh, and, and use his imagination in naming all of the creatures. If you remember that, he had a responsibility. Why didn't God name them all? Do you ever think about that? <laughs> well, think. <laughs> think with me. And, and uh, he, he let Adam name all of those. Why? Because he wanted my Adam and Adam to be creative. Are you very creative? <laughs> this responsibility is still in effect today. Man through history has been cultivating and creating the uh, intentions, uh, the inventions rather of the automobile, the telephone, the television, the airplane, the com computer, and many, many other devices that make the world a more enjoyable place to live. So all of these years we have been creating and uh, what? Cultivating and creating. So it's reasonable for you and I to believe and conclude that in the new heaven and new earth, we will be cultivating and creating. However, the process will be more enjoyable. 
Why? Because the curse had been removed. And everything is going to work perfectly. Oh, no more when you're working, Billy, and slip and bloody knuckle comes up. There, there won't be a bloody knuckle. Do you know what? Of course, probably Billy's never had to do that. He's always done it perfectly, and he never, never made one mistake like that. But that's, that's, that's the way it'll be. Have you ever hit your... <laughs> Hammer with you nail nail with a hammer. Well, that won't happen there. <laughs> My dad always put his uh, was very very good with his farming equipment. He put it up in the fall and kept it. But early about this time of the year, when the weather started getting better, it's kind of time to start planting and start to get things together. And my my dad had to put together some. What we referred to back then was breechings for a horse. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Anybody here know what I'm talking about? There, there's a, it's a real thick leather strap that grows, goes around behind the hindquarters of a horse. And this was used to hold the wagon from keeping it from going down a hill when a horse, when you're going down a hill, that, that would hold it. Well, this, this hooked to, several rings which went over the back of the horse. And what we had to do was take leather and strip it around uh, the, of those rings. And then what we would do is use brass tacks to brass to nail it in. And so my brother was, and my dad were there, and my dad had pushed the leather down where the, the end of the, where the top of the uh, brass would, uh, the, Point part would come through with a washer type, and he was pushing down the leather just like that. And my brother was, he told him, he said, tap it, tap it. And my dad was always in a big hurry. <laughs> he said, son, you have to really hit it. And when he did, boy, he nailed my brother, dad's thumb like that. My dad fell off the porch. Oh, he's screaming and yelling. And next week we were building fence. And my dad would always want the, the wire just exactly right. I mean, he had to, we had to do it. The barbed wire just had to be exactly right. If it was this high, it had to be that high for the next 50 miles. I mean, he didn't want it any other way. And so he said, I need somebody to come here and nail this, uh, nail it, staple this wire here to this post. And my brother walked over there and hit him with the, and he said, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> he walked way over here and he said, now, now drive, the, now, now, now drive down that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll be cultivating and creating. What will we be doing in heaven? We'll turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. You don't have to turn there, I'll quote it. It said, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed and as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Literally, if you look at verse 14, it says that God is at work with each one of his children, giving them the will and a power to achieve his purpose. So, it is God who plants the will or desire without our accomplish in our hearts to accomplish his purpose for our lives. And so according to this verse, God has planned a whole host of good deeds for each one of his children to do in our lives today. And if we carry out those good deeds and God has, as God has planned for us to do in the way that God has designed, then he will regard the good works as gold and silver and precious stone at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that seems to, to be uh, an indicator that what we do in this life, we are more than likely will be doing in the next life, which is based on desired God, the, the, God, the desire that God has placed in our lives now. Y'all follow me? You want to follow me here? God doesn't waste his gifts. How many of you know what your spiritual gift is? Would you raise your hand? I know what my spiritual gift is. God won't waste that gift. You'll be doing that when you get into glory. Right? 
And sometimes my gift of mercy really gets me in trouble more than you can imagine. Uh, God knows that I have a gift of mercy. So what does he do? He sends people into my life that's always asking for money for me. Did you know I can't even uh, 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 I can't even go, you know the big service station down on Broad Street in Chattanooga? I can't buy gas there. The moment I step out of my car, somebody's asking me for money. About six weeks, four weeks, five weeks ago, I went over here to fill up my tank of gas. And I was filling up a gas tank, and this lady walked across. Told me, she said, I don't know why, but somehow or another, my gift. <laughs> uh, anyway, she said, we have had an automobile accident, and my car is, needs repair. Do you suppose the church could help repair my car? I said, no, ma'am, we, we just help people with food. She said, well, I don't have any gas right now, any money for gas. So I gave her the money for the gas. We got through the visitation. What happened, Brother Billy? <laughs> but you say, well, preacher, does that bother you? Sometimes it does, but I think it's mostly the Lord testing me to see if I'm real. You see, I've been on that side too. I, I've been on the side where I did not know where the next meal was coming from. For days, my mother made gravy out of water and flour. And we had gravy and syrup and gravy and syrup three times a day. No place to go, no place, no place to find money. Set nine kids at home with no money, no nothing. And I've been there. I know what it is to be without. And I thought, well, boy, I'll, I, somehow or another, God put that gift in me, and I do like to exercise it once in a while. Maybe in the next life, God will give me that wonderful opportunity. You see, God doesn't waste his gifts. He bestows those gifts upon his children, more likely they'll be used just, just in this life, not just now, but they'll be used in the future. If you don't know what your gift is, you ought to be praying and asking God to help you to understand. And read, as we get over into chapter 12, verse 4 through 8, we'll study about spiritual gifts. Our lives here on believers, as believers, will extend beyond the grave. Therefore, we can assume that our work in the new heaven and the new earth is in, in some way resembles the work God has called you and I to do in this present world. Notice secondly, the Bible tells us that we will be ruling and reigning. Back when God created Adam, he told him the following in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish. Now this is very important. Of the sea and, every, and over the fowl of the air and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So your cat should not be telling you what to do. You should be telling the cat what to do. Your dog shouldn't be telling you what to do. You should be telling your dog what to do. <laughs> right? That was the original plan for man. Do you think animals are taking over a little bit? Go down to the grocery store and walk through the pet section and see if animals aren't taking over. I've seen people, I've gone to people's houses and didn't have hardly a thing in their house, but they had dog food to feed the dogs. <laughs> That's right. Right, Brother Billy? <laughs> We've been there, done that, got a t-shirt, even got that. Anyway. In time, God sent a second Adam, the Lord Jesus, 
and establish the second Eve, the church, to one day rule over a new kingdom. However, the reign will extend beyond the millennium all the way into the new heaven and new earth. And to be able to rule and reign with Christ sounds great. However, who gets to do this? Don't be afraid that God placed you in a place of leadership that you, you're not like. No, he doesn't do that. And those who rule and reign will be those who have a desire and have the ability to do it. And since God gave the, the right to reign over the Lord's all creation in the very same way, those who are rewarded with gold and silver and precious stones will be given the right to reign over our Lord's new creation in the new heaven and the new earth. So more than likely, each will develop and, and use more fully the particular gifts that God has given them and to our future service for the Lord can only be the object of reverent wonder and speculation now, but we can be assured that it will be a joyful rule and reign when he does come and when we are there with him. Amen? I like Dr. Henry Morris, and I have his books, and I love him and love his uh, memory. Dr. Morris had the following to write about this particular time. Listen to what he said. Space travel will be commonplace, of course, in that day. Even though it will always be impossible in any significant degree in this present world. He said the nearest star is four light years from the earth. The nearest star. That's a big place, isn't it? Since the light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles per second, and, and a year is 365.4 days, then one light year would be 5.88 trillion miles. And the idea that people can travel from the Earth to a star in space, in a spaceship, is a, simply a delusion, as Dr. Morris said. With the four systems of, of, the, of the known universe, it is a universe, not a polyverse. This idea will always be near scientific fiction. The four basic types of forces are known to be the gravitational forces, the electromagnetic forces, the nuclear forces, and the weak subnuclear forces, and these are such as to render it impossible for sizable bodies of matter to move from one body to another, or velocities even remotely approaching the speed of light. And it would certainly take many human generations for a spaceship designed under the most advanced technology conceivable ever to travel even from the earth to the nearest star. But these limitations will not apply to the spiritual bodies. They will not be constrained by gravitational or electromagnetic forces, but in the case of the angels, as the Bible says, they can fly swiftly. Our spiritual bodies will be somehow like those of angels and even like that of Christ's resurrected body so that we, like they, can move, not instantaneously, of course, but rapidly across the worlds. And thus, he says, the future service for the glory, the Lord of glory may include assignments of any, um, in many parts of the vast universe. But from time to time, Home will always be in the New Jerusalem. Even though we'll be able to travel out there, we'll always come back home where Christ is. There also, he said, went on to say, is where the mansions are which he prepared for us, and that is where we shall always return to worship. Fourthly, I want you to take notice of how they will perceive a perfect manifestation and the Bible says in the verse 4, and they shall see his face. Perhaps the greatest of all eternal blessings is reflected in this one phrase. 
Moses in the Old Testament was not allowed to see the face of God because God had declared that there shall no man see me and live. In the ancient world, criminals were banished from the presence of the king and not allowed to look upon his face. And Jesus taught that only the pure in heart would see God. However, John in his first epistle speaks of the great transformation that will take place at the return of Jesus Christ when the Bible says we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And so this must have been what inspired Miss Carrie Elizabeth, Mrs. Frank Curry to write the following words entitled in, in your hymn book called Face to Face. And it's closed by saying this, face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what it, will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me, face to face I shall behold him, far beyond the starry sky, face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. The more one thinks about it, the more excited we ought to become. Just think. One day, we will walk through the gates of heaven and get our first glimpse of Jesus. I've told you many times about a seminary professor that I had was blind. Memorize the New Testament and most of the Old Testament. He was such a blessing in my life. We were talking one day and he said to me, I got it on you, Jim. I said, what have you got on me? He said, the next face I see will be the face of Jesus. Look forward to that time. Amen. Now, there's been times in my life when I didn't look forward to it. Uh, two special times. Number one, when I was lost. And number two, when I was away from God in a backslidden condition and disobedient to Christ. I didn't want to see Jesus then. I don't, I'm not a perfect person by a long shot. But I do know this. I know that Jesus saved my soul. And I know he lives within my heart. Amen. And I know that I'm going to see him someday. Amen. amen. You're looking forward to seeing him? Say amen. amen. And let's stand together for a closing prayer. Father, there's a lot of things that we just have to speculate on, but evidently from reading what we have understood in the days before Adam and Eve sinned, they were given responsibilities. And we're thankful, our Father, that in our own dispensation, we are given responsibilities. The responsibilities is to personally walk with you and to read our Bibles and to be faithful to church. And our responsibility involves being a witness to unsaved people. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in our service for you. And may we be faithful in doing what you have asked us to do with the gifts that you've given us. May we honor and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you.